have your Bible this morning, we're going to do a little review um, of some key points in the book of Revelation. Um, we just finished that study last week, 72 teachings in the book of Revelation. So today, a quick review. And while you're turning to Revelation, uh, you can go to chapter 1. Um, next week, we'll be starting a new journey, a new book of the Bible on Sunday morning. Um, and we will have journals for those if you'd like to get one out and available for you at the beginning of service next Sunday before the first and the second service. Uh, the bookstore will be open early if you want to grab one of those. Uh, and I just found out this morning that the tweens are starting today, the same book that I'm starting next Sunday, and that was unplanned. So I think the, the Holy Spirit has a journey for us laid out, and I'm looking forward to taking that journey with you. Um, so with all that said, how are y'all doing? Good. Good. All right. Y'all ready? All right, so Revelation chapter 1 is where we are this morning, and we're going to just move through a few chapters, hit a few key points. And the interesting thing is that if you remember, when we actually started our journey through the book of Revelation, it was back in 2019. 20 was a blur, so I always have to think through that. It was in 2019, and if you remember, um, we were just starting a journey, never knowing how 2020 was going to look. And so it was, that's a crazy year that we just went through. And with all that kind of stuff that's going on in the world and things that are happening, as well as just the, just the times that we live in, uh, as, of which I shared with you last week, uh, you know, with the, the birth pains, as if the earth is groaning itself, moving towards a time when the Lord will, will return for his church and all of the things that have taken place in the last 100 years, including Israel becoming a nation, all of the other things that Daniel speaks of, those things that we've been reviewing the last few weeks as we wrapped up the book of Revelation. Um, I, even last evening, I was looking at a, uh, a, uh, a tracker, an earthquake tracker, and uh, looking at the earthquakes that have occurred since 1900 to 2020. So looking at 120 years of earthquakes plotted on a map, by date and magnitude and it plays out as a video and it's just moving along and you can see the slight intensity uh, and then right about uh, 1975 to 1977 the thing just explodes in intensity and the earth at that moment looks like a cracked egg and it never goes dark and those those fault lines again it just keeps intensifying uh, right through to today it's very interesting to actually get a visual of the intensity of that. Jesus said the birth pains would be the, the earthquakes and the famines and the pestilences in various places. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Y'all remember those things. So it's very interesting to be able to see all of those things take place, things that are happening. And when we think about the book of Revelation, uh, people generally get excited about it because it's a book of interesting things. We want to talk about chapter 13, the mark of the beast and who the beast will be and what are the timing of all of these things? And as I was thinking about just doing a review of the book of Revelation, one of the things that dawned on to me, you know, the book of Revelation, Revelation in the Greek means apocalypse. Y'all know that, right? It means the revealing or the unveiling. So the book of Revelation is the unveiling or the revealing of Jesus Christ in a way that we haven't seen him before. We know that. We see Christ show up in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, a Christophany. We've shared that. We see Christ fulfilling scripture, being born, fulfilling the scriptures like Isaiah, where it says, I give you a mystery, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And we see Jesus come into the world and we see his, life, his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his burial and his resurrection. And all of that we see. And then when we get to the book of Revelation, we see that Jesus here is revealed to us even uh, to a fuller degree, we see a clearer picture of who he is, and we've enjoyed that for the past year and a half. But one of the things that I think as we go through the book of Revelation that we often miss is that the Lord also wants to reveal to us something that's very dear and special to him. And sometimes we often miss this when we go through this. But what's dear to the Lord's heart is his bride who is known in chapter 19 as the wife. So in some ways, the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, is also Jesus revealing a clear understanding of his heart towards his bride. Now, this past week, I just celebrated uh, my 20th wedding anniversary. Um, and it's an interesting thing. Oh, yeah. Well, thank y'all. <laughs> 
Um, thank you for that. But it is interesting when you, you go through 20 plus years, uh, you, you, you build a family, you go through trials, you, you conquer things together and, and all of that. It has a tendency to draw you closer together. And as we begin to think about, I begin to think about that, I want to look at what God and what the Lord feels for his church. Because I think in the times we live in particularly, we get a, a picture of the church that is not necessarily what Jesus sees her as. In fact, we can get a misconception of the church. One of the things scripture hints towards is a coming apostasy. And we find that the church is, appears to be a lot bigger than she really is. And so, in fact, the book of Revelation, if you would turn there with me to chapter 1, we often miss is that it's written to the church. Look in chapter 1, we'll read starting in verse 4, and then we'll pray. Notice in verse 4 it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia... Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn over uh, the firstborn from the dead, excuse me, and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us, notice, and washed us from our sin in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and father to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Behold, I'm coming quick. I'm coming with the clouds, excuse me, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, a man, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So, Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, as we turn our hearts and our minds just to review a few points within this book that you've given us. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds this morning, Lord God, and give us a clearer vision and picture of your bride. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so right off the bat, we notice that John, a Jewish apostle to the church, one of the uh, 12 apostles, 11 at this point, well, 12 with Paul added, uh, is writing notice to the churches of Asia. Remember, the churches of Asia Minor, there are seven that the Lord wrote individual letters to. Y'all remember this, right? We're going to see those in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And he wrote these letters to them, and he, in, in some ways, is writing to his church. There were several actual churches in Asia Minor, but the number seven is the number of completeness. So to some degree, it's the Lord writing to the church as a whole and highlighting some things we're going to see in chapter 2 and 3 that he desires us to see. But he's being portrayed here, if, as you look at it in verse 4 and 5, He's being portrayed as the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, meaning the, the first one in the resurrection, the rulers of the kings of the earth. And he notice he says that he is the one at the end of verse five who loved us and notice how well and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So this is Jesus writing through one of his apostles and Jesus is the one who purchased the church with his own blood. Amen. We know that. We would not be saved if it wasn't for the sacrifice of Christ. And so he has a heart towards his bride and his heart is reflected, I think, in the book of Revelation. And often, often we can miss it. You know, things are getting crazy in the world that we live in. And the church is divided, it would seem, in some ways. The church is trying to figure out what to do in other ways, it would seem. Um, You know, these things we consider, but we need to view them through the Lord's eyes. And here in this book, we begin to see the Lord show us right in chapter 1 what his heart is for the church. Notice starting in verse 11, we'll pick it up in verse 10. John said, you remember this because this is all review. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard a voice or heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega. We talked about this last week. Jesus talking the first and the last. So Jesus is eternal. He's the beginning and the end. We know that he's the author and the finisher of our faith. We know that, too. Right. He is the one you meet at salvation. He is the one you meet on the other side when you when you when you get there and you see him and he greets you. Uh, Jesus is everything. And notice it says here what you see, John write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. He mentions them, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We'll talk about those in a minute. 
And John said in verse 12, I turned to see the voice which spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, notice, clothed with the garment down to his feet. So he sees these lampstands. You all already know because we've already been through it and you took notes. All right? So the lampstands represent what? The church. And it's a beautiful picture as you begin to go through all this, which we don't have time to develop all of it. But a lampstand is where you have the lamp which bears light, right? We talked about all those pictures. You can go back and listen to all of that previously. And so the light that the church bears, each lampstand represents the church or an aspect of the church. The light that the church shines forth is the very light that comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit in her. We know that, right? Y'all okay? But what the Lord wants us to see is not only is she bearing light, Jesus portraying himself as a high priest who is tending to things. But what we see in verse 13 is in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with garment down to his feet. He calls himself the son of man. He speaks in his humanity, the way that he came and related to us. And Jesus is saying, I want you to see that I'm in the midst of her, first of all. So whatever she is, Jesus is saying, I'm in the midst of her. Now, I got to back up for a moment because I think the problem is that people don't have a good understanding of what she, this bride, this wife, this church really is. In fact, many people would think of the church of you, if you really would be honest with yourself, we all have done it, and many people do it to this day. They think of the church as the building in which people meet. And often we can get confused with that. We're going to the church. Okay, we're going to attend that church. We're going to, uh, if you will, we're going to join the church, we say. Or people might think of the church as a denomination or designation to some degree. And all of that that we think would be wrong in Jesus' estimation. In fact, the word that is used for church is ecclesia. Now, this word is used 20 times in the book of Revelation. Three times in chapter 1, two times in chapter 22 and then 15 times between chapter 2 and chapter 3. And it's not mentioned at all between chapter uh, 3 and chapter 19 at all because we get this picture of the church being taken from the earth during the time of the tribulation. But she's alluded to in chapter 19 as the wife who has made herself ready. But this word ecclesia in the Greek is a compound word made up of two, ek, which means from or out of, like you might be from, I was just looking at somebody, you might be from New York, I can't see her, I just laid eyes on her, I just look at you Liz, there she is, that might, she might be from New York, okay, or of New York, and, and then the other part of this is kaleo, which means to be called by name basically, and so ecclesia, this compound word, means those who are called out by name, if, if you will, or literally it means those who are the called out ones to be separate from and separate even in this dark world in which she currently resides or a portion of the church currently resides. Are you all with me? So then the church is not necessarily at all a building or a denomination or any type of an institution, but the church is, notice, and I will, I'll explain it this way, it's the living body of those who are called out of the world, set apart by and for Jesus Christ, uh, gathered by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. She is a living, breathing institute, or organism, I should say, of believers who are born by the Spirit of God, and therefore you can't join her, you can't... Uh, you know, attend her, you literally have to be born into her as part of her by the Spirit of God. This is what the church is. And so Jesus is portraying this, his heart for her as he just shows himself here as being in the midst of her, literally tending to things. Notice in verse 14, his hair white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes a flame of fire. It speaks is, is this, the, the, the wool, the whiteness speaks of eternity, this flame of fire. 
his eyes, it speaks of his ability to see all. We've already been through all of this. His feet like brass is refined in a furnace. His voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand, notice, seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength, which speaks of the brilliance and the brightness of the glory of Christ. His, he speaks the very word of God, the sharp two-edged sword. He sees all that's going on in the church. He washes her constantly with his own word, if you will, Verse 17, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am, notice again, I am the first, Jesus says, and I am the last. He is the beginning. He is the end. It begins with him. It ends with him, which is all beautiful. The one who laid down his life to pay the price for your sin, who purchased you with his own blood, is the beginning and the end of your faith and even your existence. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, he's, he's in complete control. And so then verse 18, stay with me, says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, which is basically past tense, chapter 1, the risen Christ. Notice he says, and the things which are, y'all remember this verse is the outline, the things which are is the present tense, which is the age of the church, which John was living in, and you and I are still living in. Are you with me? And then write the things which must take place after this or literally after the church. You're going to write about the things that which take place then. That's chapter four through the end. So in other words, after the age of the church, when she's been gathered in the air, there's some things that's going to take place after we are gathered to the Lord in the air. So then he says the mystery. I love this. Verse 20. Y'all with me? In the New Testament, mystery means not the way we would use it. If, If I were to tell you a mystery... And that means something that's hidden, because you've got to figure it out. Mystery in the New Testament speaks of something that was previously hidden, which has now been revealed by revelation. Okay? Paul said the same thing of the church, that in times past, his, his, his desire and will and the purpose and the plan and even the existence of the church was a mystery to the Old Testament prophets, Paul says in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, but now has been revealed through the prophets. So the church, which was a mystery, is now being revealed So he says, the mystery of the seven stars, which are in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Y'all remember the Greek word is angelos. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. And so you go back and you think about this picture. Jesus wants you to know that he is in the midst of the church, seven being the number of completeness. He gives us a picture with these seven churches from Asia, of which he deals with all of the issues that he sees within his bride. Jesus is saying, I'm in the midst of her. I have the messenger, which we believe Angelos, the messenger, the angel, is speaking of the human element, which then would be the pastor or the, or the whatever that they had in, in, as it was going on in Asia Minor, the, the bishop, the pastor. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have that person in my right hand. I'm in the midst of the church. I'm in control of everything. Eyes of flame of fire. I see all. Sharp two-edged sword. I speak the word which is necessary to deal with the things which are happening within my church. Jesus says, I'm in the church and I'm tending to her. And I am in control. And that's good news. Because right now, over the last year, it's been some interesting times for the church. As the church has tried to I had to figure out the things which are going on. Somebody was telling me between services about a church that they know of, which is still closed after a year in a state like Texas, by the way. And I heard about a a church which is getting ready to open and they're going to have the vaccinated people sit on one side and the non-vaccinated people sit on the other side. Trying to figure things out, the church is. Sad that they see all of the things that have gone on and how it's affected the church. But what we need to understand is this. Jesus is in control of the church. She is actually his bride, and he has plans for her, and we can often miss it. Now, I want to dive in because I want you to see a few things, and y'all bear with me. We're going to look at some of the points of the seven letters because in these seven letters, I'm not going to spend... Well, I will, actually. I'll be honest with you. Because <laughs> I didn't get much further than that during the first service. But there are things as we go through this which we need to see and understand that Jesus wants us to understand and see. Because it's very important that we 
think about these things and we gaze upon them in the sense of how they reflect in our lives personally, how they reflect in our congregation, which we are part of. Um, and if, even we see hints of things through the age of the church. But the sec first one is the letter to the church of Ephesus, which is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, where in that letter, Jesus deals with some things he's concerned about. He says, you don't want to be so, uh, so right that you are in what might, we might call dead orthodoxy. Because he says to them in verse 2 of chapter 2, because I want to move along a little bit, verse 1 to the angel of the church of Ephesus is who he's writing to, verse 2 I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. In other words, you can't stand sin. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and I found them liars. In other words, you guys are on it, he said to Ephesus. You can't stand and will not stand for false teaching. You will not allow sin in your midst. You are standing your ground on all of these things, and you're doing really well. But the, the thing that we have to be balanced in, which Jesus wants us to think about before we leave the book of Revelation, is in all of this, I'm on the right side of everything as they were in Ephesus, and they were doing a good job. Notice verse 3, you have persevered and have patience. You have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. An awesome, amazing church. But the balance is, Jesus says in verse 4, if you remember, nevertheless, in all of that wonderful stuff that you're doing, not not allowing false teaching, you're calling out the false prophets, you're, 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 you're rebuking sin, you're keeping things in order, but you, he says in verse 4, have left your first love. And the challenge to the church, to the individual and the congregation is what we don't want to be is so right that we're finding ourselves in this place of dead orthodoxy where we've got everything right and we're, we're, we're battling through everything, but we're no longer keeping the commandment of just simply loving him and then loving one another. And he's challenging Ephesus there because this is extremely important. Above all other things, there must be love in the midst of the church that belongs to Jesus. And see, there's an intimacy. Listen, there's an intimacy that comes along with being a part of the church. And one of the things you got to challenge yourself today is examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Because the sad thing about it is we can get so caught up in what we think church is that we miss this so fast. In fact, real be quick before I go there, Jesus gives a solution. Verse 5, he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do your first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In other words, the three R's that I always like to mention is remember when your first love. What is your first love? Your first love is the moment you met Christ for who he is and you came to faith. Because before that, we really didn't know what love is. You know, we think we know what love is. Love is not emotional, right? Love has nothing to do with our selfish desires. Love is something that is godly, and it's, look, it's coming to a place of recognizing truth and making a decision to follow. And look, when I met Christ who accepted me, even though I was messed up, that was love. He made a decision to die when I was a scoundrel in a sense. That's, that's a love that bro broke my heart, of course, and it should, it should do for all. And we come to our faith in him. Now we know what love is. And Jesus is saying, above all other things, don't drift away from that simplicity. Don't let anything do that. Jesus says, you stay close to me. And this is what we need to hear in the times we live in. Because the, the reality is, listen, the reality is, as we live this Christian life, and all of these things go on that we see, and, and look, it seems as though the prophetic clock is ticking. The birth pains, uh, brother called me last night, his wife went into labor. I don't know, you know, a lot of you guys know what that is, definitely you ladies do. But that's a time of fear and anxiety and joy, right? And stuff that, that the beautiful thing of a child coming into the world. But it's, it's coming, and so as we see birth pains in the world begin to speed up, and we see things begin to happen, Jesus said that after the birth pains would pick up, he said that then there's going to be heavy persecution. We'll get into it in a moment where, where they're going to kill many of you and many will fall away or be made to stumble and many then would betray one another. So Jesus says that it's going to begin to heat up and we're going to see people fall away who we thought were really walking with the Lord. And then they're going to betray one another for the sake of the world and the world system. 
Well, we get hints of that in the last year. People are starting to kind of begin to do those things. So in all of that, what must you do? You must remember your first love, the one who paid for your salvation, the one who died and bled on that cross, and the one who welcomed you into his arms when you came to faith, and the one who will give you eternity, which we've been looking at in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Jesus says, above all other things, you need to stay real close to me. See, a lot of things will change between the point we got saved and the point we see Jesus face to face. The church will get shaken up. Things will happen. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen? Amen. So you must keep your eyes on him. Now, he alludes to something else in this same section that I want to touch on that we see twice in these seven letters. Verse 6. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Notice verse 15 when he was writing to Pergamos. He says, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, whenever Jesus says he hates something, we need to pay close attention to it, don't we? Because it's not often that he hates things in the scripture. God doesn't say I hate. God is always portrayed as loving, right? He loves. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So when he says I hate something, that's a big deal for God. And he's saying that there's some things that he hates that creep into his church. He doesn't want it. Nicolaitans, their deeds and their doctrine. Well, the word Nicolaitan is also a compound word. Nikeo meaning to conquer, overcome, and rule. That's what that part of the word means. And the second part, laos, is where we get into English the word laity, um, which basically means the people, the common people. How many of you have heard the word laity used within, in the church even? Anybody ever heard the word laity? Yeah. What's laity within the church? Laity would be the, the common people. The, the issue with laity, though, is by definition, it implies a little bit of a separation, if you will. In other words, there is a fraternal order of the hierarchy or the higher level of leadership, and then there's all the common people. And that can be a little problematic because, as I've always taught you, how many of you work in corporate America? Okay, you know what org charts are then, right? And I've always taught you within the Christian church, biblically speaking, on earth today, because all the apostles are dead and in heaven with the Lord, right? Okay, so then therefore that leaves on earth today what we would call a very flat org chart for the church. Okay, flat means there's not a lot of layers. So here's the org chart for the Christian church today as it relates to us here on earth. You have Jesus. He's the head, right? And then you've got us. (laughs) Jesus is trying to say as it relates to his church that there's some things that we need to be very careful about as it relates to creating these divisions of these hierarchies and these things where there is a separation, if you will, of some higher fraternal of leadership and then the laity of the people when the reality of it is. And it particularly, this is why even when you think about denominations, denominations in and of itself is an autonomous uh, a group, which means self-governing group. Um, and in some ways, there's some aspects about them which can be okay, but in and of itself, they, because they're man-led, often begin to go in a direction that doesn't please the Lord. And we need to even be concerned about that. The reality of it is, is that we need to stay very close to the Lord. And as believers, we need to understand that Jesus is always head of the church. His word is the authority within the church, and his Holy Spirit is leading the church. And any even pastor that's worth his salt comes to a realization at some point that the church itself is living and breathing and cannot be controlled. It's so difficult for us to get a, our minds around it because we do have these call to do certain things, but the church is led of the Lord. It says in Ephesians, listen, Ephesians chapter 4. I'll read verses 1 through 5. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of, of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. 
He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism even, one God and Father of all, who notice is above all, and notice who is through all and in you all. And so as we see this, there's this thing that we need to understand. First, in verse 3, it says, endeavoring to keep that which the Holy Spirit has already established which is the unity of the spirit. And oftentimes we think the church is divided and we think the church is suffering. The reality is, no, Jesus is in the midst of his church tending to everything. It's hard for us to remember and see that sometimes, but this is the reality of it. There's an intimacy within what is called the church of Jesus Christ, the ecclesia, and we need to remember that. One of the issues is that when when we see this, this, uh, Nicolaitan mentality, this somehow this over uh, structuring of the church and division of the church, we, we, we fail to realize the simplicity that is the church. And see, the insta, this insta, institutionalization, excuse me, of the church, unfortunately, has hindered the very fellowship of the church. And what I mean by that? Well, As I look at the church today and everything that we're going through, and man is so tempted and desires the church to be a certain way, and there's so many aspects of the world that begin to creep in. And, you know, I spend time with pastors as well, and, you know, people are moved by numbers and things, you know, and and, and that's not the church. Even I'm preparing for an upcoming board meeting, and so you got to do all the legal stuff and the financial stuff, and all of that's necessary and good for stewardship purposes, but that's not the church either. And what happens today is the church has been so institutionalized that it's become this organization, if you will, that's led as a business to the point that people can come and go within what we perceive to be the church and never actually find any fellowship within the church. People come on Sunday, and then they go. And then they come on Sunday, and then they go. And so they are a part of an organization of some sort. They are a part of a denomination. They're in some nonprofit or business organization that's been put together. But in all of that, they actually miss what the church is. So you don't join the church, you're born into the church. And you don't, so you, you don't go to the church or attend the church, you literally fellowship within the church and once you find that intimacy with the lord and intimacy with his bride then you're coming to get an idea of what the church is you see one of the problems is that today the church is way way larger than it it, by perception than she really is there's a time coming when the Lord seems to indicate that there's going to be a falling away of all of that. And we understand it. Look, Jesus said that he is the one in Matthew chapter 13 who sows the seed in the field. Then he explains the parable. The field is the world. The seed is the very word of God. The one sowing it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And those who are laboring for him are those who believe. Then he gives another parable and they come and they say, you know, Lord, they're tares, fake wheat in your field. Did you plant, I thought you had good seed and you planted wheat. And uh, Go read Matthew 13. You'll find I'm paraphrasing, but you'll get the point, okay? (laughs) Well, in the parable, Jesus says, no, an enemy has done this, meaning the wicked one, Satan. In other words, there are tares. Tares are uh, a type of um, vegetation that looks identical to wheat, and you can't tell them apart until the harvest comes. Because what happens during the harvest is that the wheat now is so uh, filled with fruit that it's produced that the weight of the fruit causes the wheat to bend down. It looks like it's kind of bowing. But the tear has no fruit in it, so it never bows. It stands straight up, and you can begin to see the difference at that point. So they said, well, look, do you want us to go gather the tares out of your wheat? And he says, no, 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 please don't do that. I'm paraphrasing because you're going to make a mistake and uproot some of the wheat while you're trying to get rid of the tares, okay? So right now, the church looks huge. But when the persecution begins, when worshiping the Lord begins to cost something, we'll see the numbers begin to go down. One of the things that we need to remember is that the first 300 years of the church, as you read the book of Acts, and even as you read Paul addressing the church in the epistles, 
Paul would often say, hey, greet the church that's meeting in this house and greet the people of that house, the church, you know, because what was happening is the church was just the fellowships that were meeting in various places. You follow me? And that, that went on for a long time, of course, until Constantine uh, made Christianity the state religion. And then the next thing you know, the dark ages with the over-organization of the Nicolaitans, if you will, begin to creep in and mess everything up. But before that, it was just a simple fellowship, a living organism that met everywhere that there was a body of believers. Are you with me? And one of the things I told you last year, while we were on lockdown, and now we're back, that we need to not take this for granted. Last year, when we thought there was something to really, really, really be concerned about, we, we, we locked down, and that was the right thing to do. There could be a time in the future, though, where we can't meet again for another reason. In, in this way, government saying that you no longer have nonprofit status, or it's, it's illegal now for a church organization to uh, own property or whatever, you know, it's offensive or something, you know, whatever it may be, uh, or it's not safe or whatever it may be, um, or it's hate language because these are things that are actually happening even here in North Carolina. Some of the things that I say from the pulpit are now considered harassment for those who are of the LGBT uh, and all the other letters group. Um, so these are things that are going to be taking place. Brothers on the North American continent in jail for allowing their churches to worship and fellowship, things that we never thought we would see in, on this continent that we live in and that we live on. And these are things that can come into the world. The church is not this building. It's nice to have a building, especially when the weather's not nice. It was a perfect day today, so we didn't need a building today, actually. <laughs> but you get my point. It's not a building. It's not a denomination. It's not a division of that which the spirit has already birthed and unified. Yes. And, and it's, it's nothing that man can fully wrap his hands around. But it is the called out ones, those who are called to be separate from the world, to worship the Lord Jesus, to be in fellowship with him and with one another, which is essential so much so that the Bible says that we are to never, never, never forsake the gathering but we are to do it more and more, exhort one another more and more as we see the day approaching. What day? The day of the Lord. As we see the day of the Lord creeping towards us, the Bible says that we need to get together frequently. We need to be breaking bread and praying and spending time together and, and encouraging one another in the things of the Lord because that's what the church is called to do, a city set on the hill. Amen? And so these are things that we see, and we're going to run out of time this service. But Jesus says also, look, before I get back, there are going to be times of persecution. The letter to, to, to Smyrna in verses 8 down through verse 11. Um, it, really quick, uh, just to give you a little bit of it, verse 9, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. You know, in other words, Jesus says, look, I see what you're going through. You're going through difficult times. You, you got people who are not really of me, who are claiming to be, who are coming against you. And he, he says, but in all of that, you are rich. He contrasts something. They're rich, he says, even though they're going through times of poverty. And he says in verse 10, do not fear those things which, are about, which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days be Faithful until the end, and I will give you the crown of life. You can go back and listen to the previous teaching to get into the details. But Jesus says to Smyrna, you're going to about to go through some things, and I see it. I see your poverty, but you are rich. Be faithful to the end. I'm going to give you the crown of life. This particular letter, really quick, if you all remember, Smyrna, Jesus has nothing negative to say about them. Why? Because they are a persecuted church. And in times of persecution, the church is purified and get stronger. And that's something that we need to think about in light of the time that we're living in. It's just like you. If you go through something, you're more likely to be calling out to the Lord at that moment. You're going through a sickness, a cancer, or a trial, a financial, whatever it may be that you're going through, you're crying out to the Lord in that moment because he has your full attention. In times of rest, we're distracted by the things of the world. 
And so in some ways, persecution is meant to purify the church. And through the age of the church, there are times when the church goes through these things. Now, there was an actual church of Smyrna that went through it, but it's a picture of one of the conditions that Jesus wants to address. So he's saying for the one who's hurting, the one who's going through something, hey, I'm with you in that. I see it. And in contrast, you're rich. He writes to the church of Pergamos, verses 12 through 17. This is a church which has compromised on the things of the world and has allowed themselves, if you will, to be divided. He says in verse 15, you have those there who have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Uh, my church is being divided. You have those in verse 14 who have the doctrine of Balaam, this false teacher, uh, false prophet for hire. Jesus says, I see all of this which is going on, and this is a condition that we need to be careful with. We need to be careful not to allow the world to creep in to our personal lives or even the congregation and take our attention away from the things of God. He deals with that with Thyatira, verse 18 through 23, as we're running out of time. But we need to remember 18 through 29. We need to remember these things. Because in Thyatira, he says, I have this against you in verse 20. You allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, you are allowing false teaching and false lifestyles within the body of Christ, which is seducing whether it's the, 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 the sexual immorality of sin or that of the spiritual sexual immorality of, of getting spiritually into things that we shouldn't, both probably happening. And the Lord says the issue I have with the church in that condition, listen carefully, is that she was allowing it to happen. Everybody pay attention really quick because it is an important thing within your home, within your life, and within any group of believers that gather, that things need to be addressed and confronted that can be dangerous because Jesus taught us in the Gospels that a little leaven leavens how much of the lump? The whole lump. And it's difficult because we've been taught by the world that love is emotional and being very nice. And so, therefore, if you love me, you let me have what I want. That's the reasoning of a child. A child reasons that way. If you love me, then give me ice cream for dinner, <laughs> breakfast and lunch as well. <laughs> That's how a child reasons. A parent says, no, you'll die if I do that. So you need some water and some, some greens and some protein, and, 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 and you need all of these other things because I love you and I want you to live, Okay. So the world is saying to the church, y'all don't love us because you don't agree with all the stuff we want to do. And God says, hey, church, I need you to stand strong because you need to represent me so that people can see who I am in the world. So therefore, within the church, within our personal lives, within our families and our homes, we have to confront things that are not of him right where it is and possibly even get it out from our midst so that the whole can stay healthy. And that's something that must be done. And it never feels good. It never feels good. But some of you yesterday were working on your lawns. And when you work on your lawn, you're doing it because you want it to look nice. Right? And you got stuff trying to make it not look nice. You got weeds trying to grow up. You got moles cruising through under the surface, right? <laughs> you got all this stuff happening. And so you learn that, hey, I need to tend to this thing. So I need, to, I need to weed in the season I need to weed. Then I need to feed, fertilize in the season I'm supposed to fertilize so that I can, I can kill the, 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 the weed seed so it won't come up the next year. And I can give the, the grass the, the healthy nutrient it needs so that eventually my lawn looks really good. And I know y'all do it because I see y'all over at the, at the hardware store um, during the week buying stuff. So y'all working on it. Well, it's the same thing that happens in your spiritual life, in your family, individually and within the body of Christ. So, therefore, Jesus says the issue is you see it happening and you won't deal with it. Hey, somebody in the church, go tell Jezebel to sit down and be quiet or get out. That's all he's saying here because she's, she's causing problems. And so he says, I gave her time to repent, verse 21, from her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. So, verse 22, I'm going to cast her into a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. 
it's very interesting that here the Lord says, I'm going to apply the fire of the trial to her to try to bring her to a place of repentance. You know, Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Sometimes the, the trial, the fire of the trial can bring someone to repentance who is refusing to repent. But those who want to go that way with her and commit sexual immorality with her and, and, and let it, let it uh, continue to happen, they're going to go into great tribulation. But in verse 25, those who don't have this doctrine hold fast, he says, till I come. Very interesting, the book the letter to Thyatira begins to give us an implication of some potentially going into the tribulation who refuse to repent and turn to him while others are to hold on until he comes for the church, which he meets in the air. There's a distinction being made there, and we need to pay attention to that. See, today we got whole denominations that are committing sexual immorality. They are ordaining gay and lesbian pastors and saying it's okay. But that goes against what God says. Even in this room, somebody's offended that I said it. Right now, I guarantee you. I'll hear about it probably. The truth is the truth, though. And I love you. That's why I tell you the truth. That's not what God desires. And who am I to go against what he desires? It doesn't matter what I think or even how I feel. I don't have a luxury of my own opinion even mattering. <laughs> because my creator who bought me with his own blood, who's going to welcome me, into the kingdom says this is the way I want my church to be. So we have to stand for that. He deals with spiritual death in chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Here he says, here's a church that is dead. I don't have time to read through it. But he offers them the solution, which is the Holy Spirit. I, I need to give you some of it to the angel of the, of the, of the church of Sardis, Right? These things says he who has noticed the seven spirits of God, the fullness, meaning the complete work of the Holy Spirit and the seven stars. I know your work, that you have a name, that you are alive, but notice you are what? Yeah. Don't you love Jesus? Jesus can speak the truth so, so plainly. I mean, he's like, he's looking at you like, you're dead. I love you, but you're dead. <laughs> this is the Lord. You're completely dead and, and lifeless. He's what he's saying here. But you got a name that people think you're amazing. How could that be? Can that really be? Yes, it can be. Here's a denomination maybe who was uh, founded, if you will, by one of the reformers who, 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 who brought the church back to the truth of the word of God, who did all this amazing work and a few hundred years later could be literally dead. But he says, I have the seven spirits of God. So be watchful, verse 2, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. There's a little life left, so strengthen those things because a, a, a little life can, can spread like a wildfire as well. Um, he says, for I have not found your works perfect before God. And so this is a condition. I will say today before we leave the book of Revelation for a while that if that's you today, if there's no spiritual life within you, um, if you don't sense the work of the Lord in your life at all, and you just attend church occasionally on a Sunday, uh, but there's nothing else going on in your life as it relates to the, to the Lord himself, then you need to examine yourself today. You need to come to that realization and you need to repent and turn back to him because he's the one who has the Holy Spirit who he wants to give to you freely to give you new life. The beautiful thing about what Pastor David was saying earlier during the communion is that it, the life is in the blood which was shed, if you will, that we may have spiritual life. It's all a work of Christ. It's not a work of ours at all. Isn't that wonderful? So that means that you could be the most royal mess up of all of us over the past week. And your spiritual life is not dependent upon any of that. It's dependent upon the Lord's ability to refresh you today if you turn to him and get you on the right course. It's all a work that God does. We just have to repent and turn to him. Um, so verses 7 through 13 Again, Jesus gets to a church where he has nothing negative to say. We're almost done. We're way over time. So give me two minutes. I'll borrow two minutes from you. Let me borrow four minutes from you. <laughs> I'll pay you back a minute per week for the next four weeks, okay? Y'all remember, okay? Listen, this faithful church, Philadelphia, Jesus says to them really quick, I see your works. You go back and listen to this to get the details. I've set a door before you, an open door, and no one can shut it because you have a little strength. 
their strength is dependent upon something here. It, it, part of it is because you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And verse 10 says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which is coming upon notice the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Jesus says, if you keep my word and keep my command and don't deny my name and stay the course, trusting me and walking with me, no matter what you see going on in the world around you, uh, you, you turn from all of that and continue to walk with me. He says very plainly here, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial, which is coming. Notice upon the whole world. So this is not an isolated event to test those who dwell upon the earth. That trial, ladies and gentlemen, is the great tribulation, which is going to come upon the whole world like a thief in the night. And those who have kept the command and walk with him, you're not implying that you're perfect in any way, but you're staying the course, walking with Jesus, and he's going to keep you from that hour of trial, which is coming. The, the final condition that he deals with in verse 14 through 22 is this church, which Jesus says is lukewarm because they think they got everything under control and they can handle everything themselves. But he says, you're blind, poor, and naked. And you need to turn to me. Behold, I stand at the door. He ends verse 20 and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. It speaks of intimate fellowship and he with me. And here's a condition where people think they got it all together and don't even realize that they are lost and away from him. And so all of this being said, Jesus deals with these issues that he wants to work out within his bride. Chapter 4, a picture of the bride being caught up to heaven. We see John being caught up in chapter 4. In chapter 5, there's this worship scene going on in heaven. There's no mention of the church beginning in chapter 6 when Jesus begins to open the seals. And his, he's pouring out his wrath upon the earth. Jesus pours his wrath out upon the earth. And the church is not seen again, alluded to on earth until she returns as the wife who's made herself ready with the Lord as he returns to destroy his enemy and establish his kingdom. And we see these, these distinctions made in here. And so as I look at the, and I think about the book of Revelation, it's a wonderful thing to see the day of the Lord, a lot of amazing things, imagining uh, hail uh, the size of, uh, you know, bowling balls, 100 pound hail falling in chapter 16 and the fire falling and those who've taken the mark of the beast have sores breaking out and all of this stuff is going on. Hey, y'all, we're not going to be here for that. <laughs> what he really wants us to focus on is getting things right here yes. and within our midst and fellowshipping in a way that's healthy and really being a part of the church. I've been hearing about wonderful home fellowship meetings, but my concern is for many of you who are not a part of any kind of small group, no young adults, no uh, home fellowship, no, no nothing, no women's ministry, not going to men's ministry. Just, hey, won't see you until next week this time. What happens when we might not be able to meet again in the future? The church is alive. Be a part of her, okay? Jesus loves it. We're told, don't forsake it. There's something that I do when, when we're together, Jesus says. There's something that I impart. I correct things. I, I, I get things right. I encourage. I strengthen. It's something that I experience as a pastor when I'm in the parking lot or talking in the lobby or just spending time. Things are imparted. Things are said. Things are shared. Encouragement happens. We pour into one another um, because this is how he works in the midst of what he calls his church. She is not a denomination. She is not a building. She's not a business organization. She's none of those things that man tries to make her out to be. But she is alive and she's well and she's powerful because the Lord is doing the work. Amen? Amen. And it's time for, for us to be able to discern the difference between what the world portrays. Pastor Jeffrey likes to pick on me. On Monday, he sends me, he sends me a picture of the church going berserk. Usually it's a video from Bethel. Um, <laughs> And there's all kinds of stuff happening. And I, and if, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't offend you, but it's the reality of it. It's the reality of it. It's chaos. Chaos. The church being led astray in the new age stuff. Jesus is so simple. Repent and turn to him and let him lead your life. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you today, Lord. And I do pray, Father, that even now as we fellowship, before we leave, that we fellowship, Lord, that you would be in the midst of that time, that you would just, Lord, bless us as we 
uh, love on one another, Lord God. Um, Lord, we are so thankful for those who are about to gather to learn about the purpose for baptism. Uh, Lord, make it a true celebration for them, Lord God. Bless their lives. Let those who are new in you be encouraged through this process. Let those who have repented and come back to you, Lord, uh, be encouraged in that process, Lord. We thank you for that, and we thank you for all that you're doing. In the name of Jesus, we pray and say together, amen. Let's stand and sing. God bless you all.